I was very fortunate in my youth in 1951 on an incredible accident that occurred to me. I had just joined Case Institute of Technology as a member of its faculty. And very shortly after I got there, I got to know quite well the chief recruiter from Bell Telephone Laboratories in Murray Hill. They had a regular recruiter at Case Institute who came out every month to talk to the faculty and students to make sure they got our best graduates. Their recruiter was a young fellow my age who was a Rhodes Scholar, a PhD in physics, who was head of a very small department of the laboratories called the Microelectronics Laboratory in those days. His name was Peter Myers. He and I became good friends. We started to do some work together, not in physics, I can assure you. Uh, it turned out to be quite convenient. Every month when he came out to case, he would spend the weekend with me. And at least once a month, I'd have to go to New York. We were doing work in those days. I hate to say this word now, but we were doing work at that time for Union Carbide. So uh, I would get to New York, and Murray Hill is just 30 miles out of New York, and I would go over and spend a day or two with him. So we got a lot of time together. Now, I was scheduled to spend the Wednesday with him because that Thursday and Friday, I had to be in for a meeting at Union Carbide. Uh, it happened on the Tuesday preceding that Wednesday. In the morning, I got a phone call from the company saying an emergency had arisen. Could I quickly get into New York? So I grabbed some clothing, hopped a plane, got to New York early in the afternoon, had the meeting, was done, went out, found a hotel room, got up early the next morning, rented a car, and drove to Murray Hill, New Jersey, and got to Pete Myers' office about a quarter of nine. Uh, he came in about 10 and nine. Now, Pete Myers was one of the calmest, most phlegmatic people I have ever known. He was a, just a marvelous person. But he came in that morning mad, and it's the first time I'd ever seen him angry. He didn't say good morning. He said, where the hell were you last night? I said, I was in New York. He said, I know that's stupid. I called your office. Where were you in New York? And I said, at such and such a hotel. He said, why didn't your office know about it? So I explained that I'd gone in under an emergency uh, conditions. I didn't know where I was going to stay until late in the evening and so on. But I said, Pete, what's the matter? What are you all upset about? This isn't like you. And then he calmed down. He said, oh, he said, Russ, he said, I'm sorry. He said, 4.30 yesterday afternoon, the vice president in charge of the laboratories called all the section heads and told us that we have a meeting this morning at 9 o'clock and to keep the day clear. And if it wasn't clear, clear it. This is first priority. And I got to go to that meeting in a couple of minutes. And I tried to get a hold of you to tell you not to come. He said, well, that's a shame. I wish you had, but you didn't. It's not your fault and it's not mine. I got some work with me. I'll work in your office. And if you're not back by noon, I'll leave. Well, he said, I knew you'd do that, but I just feel off. I said, well, there isn't a damn thing we can do about it. You're about three minutes before your meeting. You better get going. So he turned and started to walk out of the room, and he stopped in the doorway and turned around. He said, wait a minute. He said, why don't you come with me? I said, hell, I can't go to the meeting with you. I'm not a section head. He said, Russ, I'll never know the difference. Come on. Come on. <laughs> I said, yeah, but maybe they will, and that'll cause you a great deal of embarrassment. And he stopped me. He said, wait a minute. He said, we won't sit together, so if they catch you, I'll pretend not to know you. <laughs> I said, well, you know, it isn't going to embarrass me because they can't do a damn thing to me. Uh, sure, I'd like to see what one of your meetings are like. So he said, come on, and I went. Now, we went down the hall and came to a room. It was a small classroom. It's a rectangular room set up like this. There's a platform at the end, one step up, and a podium in the middle, and a big blackboard across the back. Two rows of seats with the center aisle. It held about 40 people, and the room was filled, almost. But we're lucky as hell, because when we entered the room, these two seats were empty, and the back row separated by the aisle. Couldn't have been more perfect, so we took them. We were obviously not sitting together, but we could talk to each other if we wanted to. Now, the VP wasn't there yet. So everybody in the room was chit-chatting, and pretty soon they began to look at their watches. It was 10 after 9, and he wasn't there yet. At the back of the room, the door that led to the room was on one of these pneumatic things, automatic closing devices, so that whenever the door opened, you got a squeak and you knew it. And sure enough, the door opened and the squeak, and everybody turned around to see if it was him, and it was. And they knew immediately that something critically wrong had occurred. 
The VP of the lab is a 220-pound, six-foot-two extrovert. He was one of these backslapping guys that knows everybody by name, and he's chit-chatting with everybody all the time. And he looked as though he were in a state of shock, as though he had just gotten word his wife had been killed or a kid had fallen off the roof or the house had burnt down, something like that. You didn't know, but he was clearly in, in a terrible state. He was looking down at the floor, hunched over instead of his usual straightforward he came down the aisle very slowly without talking to anybody, and that room was absolutely silent. As he came down the aisle, came around, got behind the podium, leaned on it with his elbows, holding his head, and just stood there silently. And God, it was really excruciating for everybody in that room. What the hell is wrong? <clears throat> but then he looked up, and I quote him exactly. He said, gentlemen, the telephone system of the United States was destroyed last night. And then he looked down. Well, the room broke out into a hubbub. We knew damn well it hadn't been destroyed last night. Hell, I'd used the phone that morning, and a lot of the other people had. So they said, you know, what the hell's up? It's either a trick or he's off his rocket. <laughs> now, it didn't look like a trick. This guy looked ill. So the conclusion was, he's probably off his rocker. We don't know what happened, but we better not report it yet. We don't have enough evidence, <laughs> especially when it's your boss. So the room quieted down. Then he looked up again, and he sighed. And I quote him exactly again. He said, I know what you were just saying to each other. You were saying you used the phone this morning, weren't you? Well, everybody was tremendously relieved because it showed he was in contact with reality. So they all smiled and you know, gave a <laughs> silly shake of the head. And then he straightened up, and he literally shook with rage. And he yelled at us, God damn it! I told you the telephone system in the United States was destroyed last night. And you better believe it, because if you don't by noon, you're fired. And then he looked down again, and I'll tell you, the hubbub really did break out, because it was clearly no trick. But it's a little dangerous to go calling the psychiatrist or the police at this point. And since he wasn't doing anybody any physical harm, they decided to wait it out a little bit, so the room calmed down again. Then he looked up, glared at us, and suddenly broke out into a great big grin, straightened up, and he looked absolutely normal. And it was like puncturing a blue. All the pressure went out of the room. It was a trick. How in the world he pulled us off, I will never know. But it was incredible what happened in that room. And he looked at us and he said, OK. He said, what was that all about? He said, I'm going to tell you. But before I do, I want to make two things absolutely clear. He's absolutely normal now, OK? First, the telephone system in the United States was destroyed last night. Second, you better believe it, because if you don't by noon, you're fired. He said, now I'm going to go on from there. And let me tell you, he had the attention of that group. He said, about a month ago, I was reading in a journal that the Bell Telephone Laboratories are the best industrially based scientific laboratories in the world. He said, I don't argue with that. I accept that. That's a matter of fact. He said, but it did occur to me to ask why. He said, the answer is obvious. It is assumed that we have contributed to the development of the relevant technology for our industry more than any other industrial laboratory has contributed to the development of its technology. He said, I accept that. But the question is, what has our contribution been? So I made a list of what I think are the major contributions of this laboratory to the development of telephonic communication since its inception. He said, now, I don't want to show you that list. I would like to check it against your independent judgment. So I want you to tell me what you think is the most important thing we've ever done. He had a pad up at the front of the room. And somebody yelled out immediately, the dial. He said, right. He said, the dial is certainly one of the most important things we've done. So does anybody know when we introduced it? Somebody said, well, it was sometime in the early 30s. He said, right. He said, by the way, did anybody know when we invented it? 
and somebody, it was a little pause, and somebody said, well, I don't know, but if we introduced it in the early 30s, it must have been sometime in the 20s, probably the late 20s. He said, look, I didn't ask you to guess. He said, I asked if anybody knew. Does anybody know when we invented it? And there was a silence. He said, I'll tell you when. Now, I don't remember the exact day, but it was about 1890. He said, that's not important, so let's go on to the next one. The second one that was yelled out was one I didn't understand at all. I couldn't understand what the hell they were talking about. Somebody said multi-phasing. I later found out what this was about. This is a way of sampling sound. So you can send six telephone conversations across the same wire at the same time. It was a technique which increased the capacity of the lines of the telephone system by 600%. He said, right. Certainly one of the most important ones. He said, when did we introduce it? And they gave a date. It was sometime between the two world wars. He said, right. He said, any of you happen to know when we invented it? Nobody did. And he told them, and it was before 1900. He said, all right, let's take another one. The third one that was called out was the coaxial cable. The cable across the Atlantic. He said, right, you've now got my top three. Same three I've got. He said, when do we introduce that? And I remember the date on that. It was introduced in 1882. Then he stood back and he said, now, gentlemen, doesn't this strike you as odd? That the three most important things ever done for this company by this laboratory were all done before anybody in this room was born. What the hell are you guys been doing? <laughs> <laughs> He said, I'll tell you what you've been doing, and it's not your fault. You've been looking at that system, identifying its deficiencies one by one and correcting them. But you haven't improved the system one damn bit. You recognize that? That was my first exposure to the argument against reactive planning. He said, there's something wrong in the way we're doing it. We're treating the parts, not the system. Gentlemen, the telephone system in the United States was destroyed last night, and we're going to spend the next year reinventing it from scratch. I said, let me tell you what we're going to do. Nothing else in the United States was destroyed, only the telephone system. Everything else is exactly the same. We are going to design the system we would use to replace the existing system with right now, if we were free to do it, not in the year 2000. We want to specify the system that we want right now, if we could have whatever we wanted, subject to only two constraints. First, the system we design is going to have to be technologically feasible. <coughs> He said, I don't want any science fiction. And then he went on to explain, and he used a beautiful example. He said, for example, you can't assume that neighbors will talk to each other with mental telepathy. So we don't know how to control that. He said, however, we don't have a communication satellite either. But we know we can have one, and we're going to. And therefore, you can use that in your design. We spent an hour exploring the meaning of technological feasibility, and when we thought we had a shared understanding of it, he said, okay, let's take the second criteria. The design we produce must be operationally viable. And he smiled and he said, now what the hell does that mean? He said, first let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It does not mean that it must be a system we can get to from where we are. He said, that's irrelevant because we're nowhere. The system doesn't exist. What it does mean is we must be able to show that the system we design, if it came into existence, would be able to survive in the current environment. Therefore, it must meet the law, it must meet financial obligations, the requirements of the stockholders, and so on. We then spent an hour discussing what that meant. Now we're about 11.30, and boy, he had an excited group. He said, now, here's the way we're going to organize to do it. He said, this is too big a group to use as a single team, so I'm going to break you up into sub-teams. 
And each team is going to have a subsystem. He said, that worries me. Because I'm going to break you up into six teams, and I don't want six designs at the end of the year. I want one design of the whole system. Therefore, each team will select a leader. I don't care how you do it and how often you change it. But those leaders are going to meet once a week, discuss the activity of their teams, and make sure they're coordinated and integrated. And if at any time they deem it necessary, they'll bring the teams together to meet together. But at the end of the year, I want one design of the telephone system. We discussed that for a while. And then he started. He said, I don't believe in any of this fancy organization theory. Here's the way we're going to do it. The first six of you, one, two, three, four, five, six. You're the long line team. Long lines is the connection between cities. So the next six of you, one, two, three, four, five, you're the short line team. You're intra-city. Next six of you are the switching. And he worked his way back to there. And he said, the rest of you will redesign the telephone. And there I was on a team. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, but I was on the same team as Pete Myers. And the meeting ended just about noon. The team immediately met at the back of the room. Pete Myers introduced me as a ringer. <laughs> the other guys laughed like hell. They thought it was funny. And they said, well, we don't mind. If you want to participate, you know, you're welcome to. And that was unfortunate because I spent most of the next year there instead of where I should have been, working back at the university. We agreed that we would meet that afternoon at 1.30 to get things started. So after lunch, we came back to this little room, sat, sat around a table, had a pad in the room, and said, now, how the hell do we start? We got the telephone set, the actual telephone. What do we do? Somebody said, well, why don't we start by making a list of all the things that are wrong with the telephone? And somebody else said, don't you realize exactly what we've been doing? Furthermore, if we take literally what he said, the telephone system doesn't exist, it doesn't have any deficiencies. Because a non-existent thing doesn't have deficiencies. And somebody else said, well, suppose it really didn't exist. How would you start? And somebody else said, well, that's like the building a house. If you decide you want to build a house, what do you do when you go see an architect? And I said, I can tell you that. What you do is you write a set of specifications. They said, what specifications? I said, those are the things you want. Like, I want three bedrooms, one kitchen, a family room, a two-car enclosed garage. They said, why don't we try that? And everybody agreed, not because they thought it was such a hot idea, but they couldn't think of anything else to do. So we took a clean sheet and said, all right, let's throw up some ideas about the properties that a telephone ought to have. Right? First one was thrown out. I want a telephone with no wrong numbers. Every call that comes in is intended for me. And everybody agreed that would be desirable. Second suggestion I thought was absolutely brilliant. I happen to have made it. <laughs> I said, I want to know who's calling me before I answer the phone. They all agreed. Third suggestion was, I want a telephone I can use without hands. No hands. Everybody agreed. The fourth one was really marvelous. I didn't make it. One of the members of the group said, you know, I'm tired of going to the telephone when it rings. I want it to come to me. <laughs> well, we were getting warmed up now. <laughs> we went on for about two weeks. We didn't meet every day. We wound up with a list of 92 of these properties. <clears throat> and it wasn't a disagreement about a single one of them. Agreed on every one of them. But eventually we ran out. So now we sat there and said, what do we do now? And one of the members of the group said, why don't we take the first item on the list and see if we can design a telephone that would have no wrong numbers. Now at that point, I made a very serious personal error. See, I had once taught logic. And I thought I had a special skill that was of value to the group, and I tried to use it. I said, now you realize, of course, there are two kinds of wrong numbers. One is when you have the right number in your head and you dial it incorrectly. And the other is when you have the wrong number in your head and you dial it correctly. And the same system probably won't eliminate both. 
one of the members of the group immediately said, yeah, but suppose you got the wrong number in your head and you dial it incorrectly and get the right number. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that shut me up for a while. Uh, we all agreed, however, that it was important to know which type of wrong number was the most prevalent. Now, at this point, I was able to do something useful. I knew the head of the psychology department in the lab. I had worked with him before, so I picked up the phone in the room and called him, Dr. Carlin. And after a few amenities, I said to him, Sam, uh, do you happen to know anything about the relative frequency of wrong numbers. And the guy exploded at the other end of the phone. He became an inarticulate, <laughs> sounded like that. It took him five minutes to calm down. It turned out he'd been doing research for 17 years on wrong numbers, and I was the first one to ask him about it. <laughs> After we finally got him quieted down, he gave us the information we needed. Four out of every five wrong numbers is the right number incorrectly dialed. And so that was the first <coughs> focus of our attention. We're now going to take a stretch while they change this damn tape and we'll find out what happened. Let me show you what we came up with. You take a typical desk set of a telephone, look at from the top down, you got something that looks like this. And you have the dial over here. We took the dial off the telephone. We put something else in its place. Now, something else that you all have around today but didn't exist in 1951. We put a hand calculator on the telephone. That is, we put a register and 10 buttons, one for each digit, plus an 11th button, in the corner. And the way you were going to use this telephone was as follows. You come to the phone, and you do not lift the receiver off the hook. You leave it there. You put your number into the phone by pushing the buttons. The number you push in shows in the register. Now remember, you got the right number in your head. Huh? You now look at the register. Is that the number you intended to call? If it is, you pick up the receiver and the whole number goes through at once. If it isn't, you hit the red button, which is a clear button, and start over again. Eliminate the incorrect dialing of, wrong, of right numbers, virtually. Well, we were so excited we couldn't contain ourselves. It was a little problem, though. We didn't know whether it was feasible. Remember, there were no hand calculators. The chip didn't exist in those days. So we called up the electronics department and said, we need some technological advice. Can you send some experts over? About a half hour later, two young men, looking as though they were fresh out of MIT, uh, came in and said, what do you want? So we started to explain to them what we were interested in and wanted to know whether this could be done. As we were describing this to them, they began to whisper to each other, consulting with each other, paying less and less attention to us. Now, this was rude, but that's standard with Bell Labs. <laughs> but what they eventually did was not. They got up and left the room without any explanation. We were so damn mad we couldn't contain ourselves. And we decided not to chase them or the hell with them. You know, we went on to something else. Well, about three weeks later, these two young men reappeared in the room again, looking very sheepish, and saying, look, we're sorry about what happened last time. You probably wonder what we did, why we left the way we did, and we'd like to explain. Well, we expressed some interest in knowing what had happened. So they said, you know, what you were telling us was really very exciting, but not for the reasons that you thought. You see, that wrong number stuff isn't very interesting, they said. But those buttons, those are really a nice idea. So we ran out of here, went back, and built a telephone with push buttons. We have tested it on 2,000 people since we saw you. They said, you know it takes 12 seconds less to put a number into a telephone by pushing buttons than turning a dial? That's a 20% increase in the capacity of the telephone system. Over in our department, they said, we have started a project this week to develop that telephone. And it's got a code name. They said, we've decided to call it the Touchstone Telephone. Now, that's where the Touchstone Telephone came from. But that was only the beginning. 
In the course of the next year, we designed telephones that covered every single one of those 92 properties, and they were feasible. Those phones have all been built. They're not all commercially available, but they all exist. Many of them you know. The video telephone was a product of that. Teleconferencing was a product of that project. The fact that you can now go visit your friends and receive your phone calls there if you want them to is a product of that project. I have used a telephone the size of a hand calculator standing on top of a mountain in the Poconos, talked to Paris, France, had no wires, hung from my neck, it came with me, and when I was talking on the phone with somebody else was trying to get me, it told me that and told me who it was and allowed me to deliver a message to them without stopping my original conversation. All that's been done. Every major technological change that occurred in the Bell system since 1953 came out of that project. And most that will occur between now and 2000 will still come out of that project. It's going to take them that long to use all it produced. Incredible experience. That concept has become the core of interactive management and planning. Now, let me explain. It starts by taking the organization to be managed or planned for. <coughs> it can be seen it. It was destroyed last night. It no longer exists. The exercise is to redesign it from scratch, developing a conception of the organization you would replace it with right now if you were free to replace it with any organization you wanted subject to the conditions I gave you. Now, there are some additional conditions which are discussed in the book, and I don't have time to go into them now, but that's the fundamental idea. That is called an idealized redesign of the system. And that's the core of the process. You will stand there and say, how do I get back to where I am? Now, let me show you what happens when you do this. First, when you engage an idealized design, it enables everybody in an organization to participate. Everybody. Why? In normal planning, when you say, what can be done to improve CNET? You can't contribute to that unless you know a great deal about CNET. You've got to be an expert. And experts are a subclass of the culture, population. Everybody can participate. What the hell can the janitor contribute? But when you ask about a system, what ought the system to be? Then anybody who's affected by the system has some relevant opinions. There's no such thing as an expert on an odd question. So that I don't know anything about banking, but you ask me what ought a bank to be, boy, I got all kinds of ideas, because I got to use those damn things, and they're stupid. I would like to have a bank in which I could walk to cash a check where they don't treat me like John Dillinger, for example. <laughs> I would like to have a single account, not model of accounts, the insurance arrangement on deposit, absolute not, and on and on and on. I can list all those things, and yet I don't know anything about how a bank works. This has an incredible impact. Everybody in an organization can participate.